Hi, my name is Jack Rackham, and today I'm going to show you the family tree of the great classical Persian empires, specifically the Achaemenid dynasty and the Arsacid dynasty, otherwise known as the Parthians. We'll be tracing the emergence of one of the oldest continuous civilizations from the Iron Age, examining its swift dominion over Egypt, Anatolia, and the Near East, and watching the evolution of the famous Greco-Persian Wars into a centuries-long rivalry with the Roman Empire. Without further ado, let's get into it. Persia, in one form or another, is one of the oldest civilizations in the world, appearing in its first form at the end of the Iron Age. This was the Median Dynasty. No written sources have survived from the Medes themselves, but from what we can piece together from writings left behind by their neighbors, they were a group of people living in minor kingdoms loosely united by one hegemonic ruler. One of these minor kingdoms was ruled by a man named Achaemenes, who helped the Median Empire in their wars against the Neo-Assyrians. It's Achaemenes, by the way, who gives the Achaemenid dynasty its name. He had a son named Teispes, who captured an important Elamite city near the Persian Gulf, and from what we can tell, it seems he actually became a vassal of the Assyrians, suggesting that some of these smaller kingdoms tended to go back and forth between whoever was the more powerful force in their region. During the reign of his son Cyrus I, those forces began to shift again. A king named Nabopolassar declared independence for Babylon, and with the help of the Median Empire, the Neo-Assyrian Empire was utterly destroyed, with its lands being carved up between its two conquerors. Most of the empire went to create the Neo-Babylonian Empire, but Cyrus's kingdom ended up going to the Medes. Over time, the Achaemenids must have ingratiated themselves to the Median king somehow, because Cambyses I was married to the king's daughter Mandane, who was also the granddaughter of the king of Lydia in western Anatolia. And together, they have a son who became known as Cyrus the Great. Because Cyrus was so influential to the history of the region, and because so little was actually known about his early life, all sorts of stories sprang up about his birth. For example, it was said that his grandfather, the King of the Medes, had a dream about Mandane giving birth to a flood that swept over the world, so he ordered her son to be killed. But his general didn't have the heart to kill a newborn, so he swapped him out with his own stillborn son. If you're thinking this story sounds a little similar to the story of Paris of Troy, it might have something to do with the fact that these myths about Cyrus were largely written down by ancient Greek historians. When Cyrus became a man, the general who saved his life revolted against the Median king, and Cyrus seized the throne of Persia, marrying either his aunt or his great-aunt to solidify his rule. After that, he was invaded by the king of Lydia, named Croesus. If you've ever heard the expression, rich as Croesus, that has to do with the fact that Lydia was home to a river with an abundance of a gold alloy called Electrum, just sitting at the bottom. And this even makes its way into Greek mythology. Since Troy was located in the same area, one of its kings was called the richest man in the world, and one of his connections to the gods? The nymph Electra. Anyway, Cyrus conquered Lydia, and then quickly did the same to Babylon, meaning the Neo-Babylonian Empire, despite being made famous through stories from the Bible and tales of the Hanging Gardens, was actually a very short-lived state. Now, Cyrus was a very big deal for a few reasons beyond having a lot of land. He created the semi-feudal satrapy system, which every empire in the area would use for the next thousand years, and he's remembered in Judaism and Christianity for rebuilding the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, which made him the only non-Jewish person to earn the title of Messiah. Cyrus continued to expand his empire, but while he excelled at conquering and assimilating cities, his attempts to conquer the nomads of Central Asia were foiled, and he lost his life in battle. Shortly before he died, he had made his son Cambyses his co-ruler, and he picked up right where his father left off. Cambyses turned his attention to Egypt, since the longtime pharaoh had just died and his Greek allies were preoccupied with threats from Sparta. 
In only a few years, he managed to conquer the kingdom and become suzerain of Cyrene, or eastern Libya as well. He tried to expand southward into Ethiopia, but ultimately the empire was just about at its greatest point territorially, and he died on his way to put down a rebellion. He was succeeded by his younger brother Bardia, but supposedly Bardia was already dead. The story goes he had been killed by Cambyses after he had a prophetic dream about his brother on the throne, but the public never found out, and he was replaced by an imposter named Gamata, who declared himself king. It was this very rebellion that Cambyses was trying to quell before he died. A group of Persian nobles then found out about this supposed ruse and killed him, proclaiming Darius as the new king. In reality, there's a good chance this was all made up. Bardia was a governor of one of the empire's provinces, so it would have been difficult for him to be assassinated and replaced with an imposter without anyone knowing. It's more likely that Darius needed any reason he could to stake his claim as king, since he was at best a third cousin to the last king. Although, an actual imposter did show up about a year after Bardia's death, trying to take power away from Darius. But, yeah. Darius was certainly not high in the line of succession, and in fact, he may have even invented some family members to insert himself. Even Achaemenes, the founder of the dynasty, isn't mentioned in any of the genealogies written down by Cyrus the Great, and his name only shows up once Darius becomes king. Now, while Cyrus and Nebuchadnezzar are characters from the Bible who appear in the historical record, this King Darius shouldn't be confused with the one from the story of Daniel in the lion's den, who's thought to be a legendary or mythological figure. When Darius took the throne, he was faced with numerous rebellions, but managed to put them each down. One of these rebellions was supported by the city of Athens, and this would begin a long period of conflict between Greece and Persia that's been made quite famous. You may have heard of the Battle of Marathon, from which the race gets its name. This was when a messenger ran 140 miles to Sparta to call for aid, only to be turned down. The Athenians won the battle without them, but had to march 25 miles in full gear in order to prevent a follow-up attack on Athens itself. These two stories got merged together over time to become the story of a single runner running 25 miles to Athens to announce the victory, and then falling over dead. While Darius never conquered all of Greece, he was still successful in taking over Thrace and Macedonia, and he made a lot of small expansions in Libya, the Caucasus, and the Indus River Valley. He was succeeded by Xerxes the Great, who looked nothing like he does in the movie 300, but that is the same guy. Like his father, he had a number of revolts to put down in his early reign, but afterwards he turned his sights to Greece. And this was the war in which the small force of soldiers led by Leonidas of Sparta made a heroic last stand before being betrayed and defeated. Xerxes' army went on to capture Athens, too, and burnt it to the ground, taking all of mainland Greece, until the Greek navy defeated the much larger force and Xerxes was forced to retreat across the Hellespont. Xerxes was married to a woman named Amestris, which might ring some bells among anime fans. She was one of the few queens who came from outside a select few noble families, and is believed to be the loose inspiration for the character of Esther in the Bible, the woman who unveiled a plot by the king's advisor to lead a genocide against the Jewish people. Later, an assassin kills Crown Prince Darius and Xerxes, or else kills Xerxes and pins it on Darius so he'll be executed. So Artaxerxes is the one to take the throne, and of course he has more rebellions to put down in Egypt. Artaxerxes was still interested in conquering Greece, especially when the Greeks began to plot a way to recapture Thrace and Ionia, but he would try a sneakier approach. Artaxerxes began supporting Athens' rivals within Greece in hopes of having them fight each other. He even had the man who defeated his father come to serve him in his court after he was exiled from Athens. But this strategy ultimately led into renewed open conflict where the Persians were once again defeated. Xerxes II is believed to be Artaxerxes' only legitimate son. He ruled for 45 days in the heartland of the empire, but never gained universal support and was killed by his half-brother Sogdianus, 
Sogdianus was then captured by his brother Ocus and begged not to be killed by the sword, or by poison, or by hunger. What Ocus ended up doing was locking him in a room filled with ash that would be blown around until his brother asphyxiated. When Ocus took the throne, he took the name Darius II. Much like popes today, Achaemenid kings had a personal name, and then took a new name when they came to power. Only, instead of taking a different personal name, like the popes, they were more like Chinese emperors, in the sense that their names tended to translate to some sort of positive character trait. In the case of Darius, that was Darius, he who holds firm the good. Little is known about Darius II, aside from facing a rebellion by the Medes and again trying to defeat the Athenians and their Delian League. After Athens' disastrous blunder in Sicily, led by the famous scoundrel Alcibiades, Darius allied himself with the Spartans and their Peloponnesian League, which allowed him to reclaim the Ionian coastline. Darius died after 19 years on the throne, and was succeeded by Artaxerxes II, who right off the bat had to face up against his brother Cyrus, who had the support of the Spartans. This war culminated in a huge battle, and Cyrus's army emerged victorious, but Cyrus himself was dead. The stranded Greek soldiers then had to scramble to organize themselves into a marching republic in order to survive their return home from the hostile Persian heartland, a story recorded in Xenophon's classic Anabasis. With the Spartans' favorite slain, and with Sparta's influence on the Ascendant, their alliance with Persia grew fragile, and they invaded Asia Minor. But this would also be their downfall. Persia retook Ionia once again, and worked to prohibit Greek cities from forming leagues, and Sparta was supplanted by Thebes as the dominant Greek power. But what Artaxerxes II gained in Ionia, he lost in Egypt, as Athens helped them to declare independence and start the short-lived 28th dynasty. Artaxerxes sent in his general to reclaim Egypt, but he failed, and was forced into retirement. He was replaced with a man named Datames, but when it became clear to Datames that he wouldn't have any greater success than his predecessor, he weighed his options, thinking of what it would mean if he came home empty-handed considering he had enemies in the royal court. So instead, he turned his army around against the Persians, soon joined by other satraps, and of course Athens and Sparta gave them their support as a way to rob Thebes of their benefactor. However, Artaxerxes managed to reunite the empire just shortly before his death, and the empire was passed to Artaxerxes III. Artaxerxes III was a very unlikely candidate for the throne, but before his father passed away, one of his brothers was executed, another committed suicide, and one was murdered, so the job fell to him. He had his satraps give up their mercenary armies so they wouldn't be such a threat to him. But still, his brother started a revolt with the help of Athens and Thebes. Artaxerxes was able to defeat him, but he fled to Macedon, where he introduced himself to Philip II. And if you recognize that name, you'll know that the Achaemenids' time in power is quickly coming to a close. After dealing with more independence movements, Artaxerxes III was able to finally reconquer Egypt. If it gives you any idea of what kind of a state the kingdom was in, Artaxerxes II was part of the 27th dynasty of pharaohs, and Artaxerxes III began the 31st. As punishment, Artaxerxes III tore down city walls and began a reign of terror so Egypt could have no hope of revolting in the future. But as Macedonia grew stronger in the background, stripping his empire's defenses would surely come back to haunt him. Artaxerxes III was killed by a eunuch named Bagoas, and replaced by his son Arces, who became Artaxerxes IV. But he was really just a puppet king, doing the bidding of Bagoas. But the other advisors also had influence over him, and they saw the game Bagoas was playing. Arces decided to have him murdered, but Bagoas poisoned the king first. So he was replaced with Darius III. Darius, already in his 40s, was much more independent than his cousin. Bagoas tried to poison him as well, but Darius caught him and forced him to drink his own poison. But while Persia was dealing with internal strife, Greece was united by a new league. The League of Corinth, led by, that's right, Macedonia. 
And this time, the League included all of Greece, and they took an unprecedented aggressive action of directly invading Persia. Philip II died during this war, which should have been a great blow to the Greeks, but he was succeeded by Alexander the Great, who very quickly won several major battles against Darius III, even when the latter had assembled one of the largest armies of all time and intentionally staged his fight on every advantageous battlefield he could find. Licking his wounds, Darius had lost the respect of his men, and two of them suggested he ought to be relieved of his command, to have the army returned to him after Alexander was defeated. But such terms were unacceptable. Giving them the army was tantamount to giving them the empire. Their hands forced, the men tie him up in an ox cart, but just then, Alexander's army attacked, and Darius's advisors stabbed him and left him for dead. Alexander buried the King of Kings with full honors, and took from him his signet ring, symbolically holding the Empire in his hands from that moment on. One of Darius' killers continued fighting under the name Artaxerxes V, but he was captured by Alexander and tortured before being executed. And so, Persia would be ruled by the descendants of Alexander's general Seleucus for a number of centuries. But, this tree isn't over yet. There's a small connection through one of Artaxerxes II's sons, Phryapatius. At least on paper, anyway. There's 200 years in between these two men, so by this time, a lot of people had some kind of connection to the Achaemenid family. This sort of claim is a common tactic by conquering houses to give themselves an air of legitimacy, so it's very likely the Parthians invented a genealogy for themselves, connecting them to the respected Achaemenid dynasty. But who are the Parthians? Well, they're sort of a mysterious dynasty. They rivaled Rome for centuries, but we're left with very little information about them in comparison to the Seleucids who came before them, the Sassanids who came after them, or even the Achaemenids. They begin with Arsaces, from whom we get the alternate title, the Arsacid dynasty. He was a nomadic leader living north of Persia. After one of the Persian satraps revolted, and before the Seleucid king could take back control, Arsaces deposed the satrap and claimed the region as his own independent kingdom, managing to repel the Seleucids, who at that point were dealing with an independence movement in Greco-Bactria, and ongoing rivalries with the other Hellenistic states of Greece and Egypt. Arsaces founded a new city called Arsac and crowned himself there, and this is the moment used by later Parthian rulers as the founding of the dynasty. They must have been very fond of him, as his name became used as an honorific, kind of like how a lot of Roman emperors took the name Caesar. Once the Seleucids' attention wasn't diverted elsewhere, Antiochus III, the Great, vassalized Arsaces II, and then turned west to fight Rome as they grew in power in the eastern Mediterranean. Arsaces' successor, Priapatius, evidently won back the kingdom's independence, since he regained the ability to mint his own coins, and adopted for himself the Greek title Basilius, placing himself on equal footing with the Seleucids. However, his kingdom was far from being able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them yet. Phraates I began expanding the empire, first by taking over a group of people supposedly under the rule of the Seleucids, but the Seleucids don't appear to have retaliated, so presumably these people weren't under firm control to begin with. But then came Mithridates the Great. Not to be confused with Mithridates the Great of Pontus, Mithridates I of Parthia expanded the empire considerably, making it a major power. He took over Babylon and everything to the east that used to be held by the Seleucids, including Media, the home of the Achaemenids. So it's fitting that he revived the title King of Kings. He also founded the great city of Ctesiphon, which would serve as the Persian capital for almost 900 years. He reigned for almost 40 years, but his son Phraates II was only a teenager when he came to power. As a result, his mother Renu ruled on his behalf for much of his reign. They defeated the Seleucids in war, killing the emperor. They planned to conquer Syria and realize the Parthians' long-standing ambition of reaching the Mediterranean Sea. But they faced threats from nomads in the east that had migrated to their borders from modern-day China. 
Desperate to put an army together, Phraates included many captured Seleucid soldiers in his army, but when he faced the enemy in battle, the Seleucids refused to fight, losing Phraates the battle and his life. He was followed by Artabanus I, already an old man who reigned for three years before dying at the hands of the same nomads that killed his nephew. But his successor, Mithridates II, defeated them once and for all. Beyond that, he expanded Parthian rule into the Caucasus and asserted dominance over the kingdom of Armenia. But it was a victory that would cause a great deal of strife over the following century. In the meantime, it was during Mithridates II's rule that the first direct contact between China and what we know as the West occurred. As Emperor Wu of Han was rapidly expanding westward, he ran into the Parthian sphere of influence, and we have records of Chinese travelers describing the land. Mostly, they talk about where Parthia was, how big it was, that people lived in cities rather than migrating, but they commented on a few strange things, like their tradition of creating an entirely new currency with the face of their current ruler each time the last one died, birds that laid eggs the size of pots, and the Parthians being, quote, very skillful at tricks that amaze the eye. After Mithridates' death, however, our sources all but disappear in what's known as the Parthian Dark Age. Here we know very little beyond the names and dates of some rulers recorded much later that seem to overlap, and a bit of what we can piece together from Roman sources. This wasn't a complete collapse of the empire, but various regions did become independent and got reconquered, and Armenia briefly eclipsed Persia as the predominant power in the east, until Persia invaded in 64 BC and brokered a deal with the Roman general Pompey, as the two empires' borders came in contact with each other for the first time. The Parthian Dark Ages ended with the accession of Orodes II, who murdered his father and brother. He was the emperor in charge during the Battle of Carre, one of Rome's biggest military disasters where Crassus lost his life and the Roman battle standards fell into the hands of their enemies. But from then on, Parthia and Rome continued in a stalemate. Orodes later killed the general that humiliated Rome because he was growing too powerful. Then he tried to invade Roman Syria and carve out a western shoreline and failed. Then his son was killed by Cassius, one of the men who killed Caesar, and yet Persia sided with him in the civil war, which of course they lost. But then when Rome appeared to have the upper hand, they couldn't press their advantage either. Shortly after, Phraates IV killed his brothers to become king, and maybe his father as well, depending on which Roman historian you believe, Mark Antony invaded Persia and made it all the way to the Caspian Sea before he had to turn around to fight Armenia and then to fight Octavian, giving up everything he'd gained. At one point, a rival of the king kidnapped the crown prince and fled with him to Rome. Phraates negotiated his son's release with the Romans, and it turned out all they wanted in return were the battle standards lost at Carre. And along with the crown prince, Octavian also sends to the Persian court an Italian slave girl named Musa as a token of goodwill. Phraates took a liking to her and made her his queen, and together they had a son. Musa proposed that to avoid having his children killing each other for the throne like he did and his father did, he should send his four eldest sons from another marriage to Rome. That way they won't have access to Parthian armies and they won't be privy to Parthian intrigue. The king didn't want to see his children die at each other's hands, so he heeded his wife's words. But it was all a trap. Musa poisoned him, and with the other heirs missing, became co-ruler of Persia, along with her son, Phraates V. However, the Parthians were unhappy with a foreign-born former slave and her son on the throne, especially when they were forced to give suzerainty of Armenia back to the Romans. So the two of them were killed, and replaced by an Arsacid king of unknown ancestry. From here, the history of the Empire is, for the most part, a long stalemate between itself and Rome, but one expressed through many hopeless wars rather than a state of peace. One of the largest of these wars was between the king Volgaces I and Emperor Nero. Volgaces had installed his brother as the king of Armenia, and though the Roman general Corbulo was able to burn down the Armenian capital, the ultimate result ended up being something of a draw. It was agreed that the ruler of Armenia would henceforth be an Arsacid prince, but any successors would need to be approved by Rome, and a Roman garrison would be stationed within the country. 
The Chinese would make a few more appearances in Parthia, once attempting to pass through in order to open up diplomatic relations with Rome, but the Parthians successfully convinced them that the only way to travel to Rome was far too long and too dangerous, and so Chinese accounts of Rome ended up being based upon what information was given to them by the Parthians. Eventually, the Parthian Empire became so weakened by its wars with Rome and internal strife that it was supplanted by the Sassanid dynasty, who would go on to fall victim to the exact same thing. But that's all we have time for today. Make sure to leave us a like if you enjoyed the video, and let us know if you'd be interested in learning more about any of the other Persian dynasties. And thanks for watching.